Good morning, everyone from Toronto, Canada, and good afternoon and good evening to all those joining us from across the world. A very, very warm welcome to our featured guest and to our audience at the first episode of Greenhill Foundation's web series, Women Impacting the World. My name is Gekka Shabasu. I'm the founder president of Green Hope Foundation, and I will be one of your moderators today. My co-moderators are Erin Isabel, Outreach Officer of Green Hope Foundation, based in Dubai, and Joshua Saji, Campaign Officer of Green Hope Foundation, also from Dubai. Now, inequality is the very basis of human society, unfortunately, and with one half dominating the other. In as the famous saying by Letty Hawkribbon goes, when men are oppressed, it's a tragedy. But when women are oppressed, it's a tradition. And it is this mindset that condones women being burned for dowry or allows a female infanticide in the age of hyperloops and SpaceX missions. The COVID-19 pandemic has literally shown the spotlight on the continued inequality and vulnerability of women and girls affecting us disproportionately, be it in terms of layoffs in the corporate world or in access to healthcare and basic needs of sustenance. We women and girls fight inequality from the womb to the grave. And perhaps that is the source of our resilience and strength 2,500 years ago, Socrates said, once made equal to man, woman becomes his superior. And there are enough examples in history and in the modern world that women are make better leaders. They exemplify this. But the question remains, why should this be an exception? Why should the biases exist? Why can't we have a level playing field and why should there still be such inequality in the 21st century? These are some of the queries that we will seek to address through our webinar series, Women Impacting the World, as seen through the life stories of some of the most iconic women leaders of our times. So we are delighted to welcome today, Madam Audrey Kiragawa, Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Parliament of the World's Religions the first woman to hold this position as our inaugural speaker. Madam Kiragawa, we are so honored to have you with us today. And we got to ask, how did you start your journey and what motivated you to do so? Well, thank you, Kikashan, for this invitation to participate with you, Erwin and Joshua, and the Green Hope Foundation on Women Impacting the World. I feel very privileged to be your inaugural guest. All journeys, including that of life itself, begins with the fact of, of course, being born. And I consider the fact of being given life itself to be a sacred gift from the divine. Life is extremely precious. The journey that one undertakes in life is shaped by so many factors, upbringing, the cultural, racial, national, and political context in which everyone's journey is undertaken and the influence of the many persons who enter into your life that have impact upon you. So all of these things taken together shape who you become along the way. So I was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, the capital city of the 50th state of the US. And at the time of my birth, Hawaii was still a territory of the US and it did not become a state until 1959. So Hawaii is unique in US history because of the fact that a major attack from Japan on December 7th, 1941, when bombs were dropped on Pearl Harbor, which is a major US naval station situated in Honolulu, uh, it actually brought the US into World War II. So that attack killed a couple of thousand US personnel and civilians, about 68, and destroyed or damaged U.S. naval ships, including eight battleships. 
So today, Hawaii still remains a very important situs for our military, with all branches of the military being located there. And I myself was raised in very poor neighborhoods, as my parents were hardworking, working class people. As with many historic families, his, uh, excuse me, immigrant families, we took whatever work was available to us. So my maternal grandmother worked on the plantation and eventually became a peanut vendor at the stadium and in front of Sears Roebuck department store in Honolulu as well. And she herself was illiterate and could only put an X for her signature. So I share these personal stories to bring home how on a very personal level, people, the women in my life really helped to shape who I ultimately became. So my mother was very committed to the fact that all of her children would have college degrees. She herself was deprived of being able to realize her dream of becoming a teacher because she was the eldest child and had to go to work to support the family. And she could only go up to the fifth grade uh, because she was sent to work as a maid. And you know she thought she was being sent to attend school on the island of Oahu. She lived on Maui at that time. And she was just crushed to discover that she was being sent away to work. So this is the gender disparity that many uh, women experience, especially in Asian, uh, in Asian families, where the man child is very um, elevated and the girl child is expected to be sacrificing for the boy child. So that is the environment that I grew up in. And my mother worked very hard as a maid, housekeeper, waitress, and she eventually owned her own restaurant businesses. And thereafter she became, you know, uh, she owned several restaurants and uh, her reasoning, and of course, you know, she was very practical. Her reasoning was that at least the children, if anything happened, the children would be able to have food. So, you know, she is a, a very important role model in my life. And of course, there is another very important role model in my life. And that was my spiritual mother. And she is a person who really influenced me in a way that transformed my life was way beyond uh, what I could ever expect was possible. So she gave me the most profound, beautiful expositions on the divine that one could ever have the privilege to hear. And she awakened my spiritual heart and gave me something so exquisitely beautiful and profound that changed my entire orientation toward understanding the deeper meaning of our sacred lives. And with her, I experienced a deep inner peace, the quietude of mental processes, while simultaneously given a heightened acuity and awareness to perceive and live in a way that was different, even as I had to function in the world to see clients, go to court, and carry on with everyday life. So these women figures in my life and I'm sure women figures and role models in everyone's life has real primacy. Why? Because we all are birthed from the womb of women. Wow, that's very true. Um, and I think we can all learn a thing or two from Madam Kitagawa's experience. On the flip side, what kind of challenges did you face along your journey? Oh. There are so many challenges I could write, you know, multiple volume encyclopedia. <laughs> However, I am not unique in the challenges uh, that I faced or even having challenges. Everyone has challenges and no one is exempt from challenges. So what I found out about having challenges is that what is important is that the challenges help you to learn more about yourself 
as you experience the challenge. And really, along the way, there are wonderful people in your life who are always there to support you and be with you as you experience the challenge. And along the way, there are so many people who give us love and understanding in their own way by helping in whatever way that they can, whether it's in obvious, a subtle or quiet ways, and just letting you know that they are there and present for you. And these wonderful, loving people are everywhere including those on this call, including in your audience who have joined us today and those who have not joined us today. So there are many people in the midst of our lives who enter into our lives and who really are angels in our lives. And it really speaks to our own inner development as a person when we don't fully appreciate the gifts of the spirit that are being given to us to the many people who surround us as we are going through challenges. So the true challenge is not that we are bereft of having loving and caring people in our lives, but that we don't fully appreciate the many ways in which people try to share their love and kindness with us. And communication difficulties, of course, can lead to many misunderstandings, and it can be a challenge in and of itself to untangle misunderstandings that arise from non-communication, miscommunication, misinterpretations, and the like. And it is always an ongoing work in progress throughout our lives because of the many people who come into our life along the way that bring their own perceptual fields, enculturations, biases, and so forth. So the challenges are specific, they're also general uh, and universal in themes. And so, you know, whatever I may share of any specific challenge would have commonality for many people because it's not, these challenges are not unique, even though as we may be going through the challenge, we may think that they are. Absolutely. And I think it's uh, so true that we've seen with uh, Green Hope Foundation as well, and even in our own lives, that uh, these challenges that we continually face, we sometimes think that, yes, it's we're the only ones going through it. But yeah, it's uh, not, and especially as a woman, I can completely understand uh, that. And I think that leads very uh, well into our next question that we wanted to ask you. We know that women face additional obstacles when it comes to leadership. So if we were to delve deeper into what you just said, were there any challenges or even generally anything that women would face in the field specifically? Well, you know, of course, I'm a lawyer by a degree and profession. And so specifically in the law, I went to law school at a time when there were not many women. And when I started practicing, I was one of few women in the legal profession. So I joined a law firm where I was the only woman lawyer. And uh, we had an open house for brand new offices that we moved into. And I recall the senior partner of another law firm named Ed approached the senior partner of the law firm that I had just joined named Tom. And when Tom introduced me to Ed, Ed looked at him and said, Tom, what's a good Republican like you doing hiring a female lawyer? So when I had my first trial, I went to court and the male attorney on the other side came dressed with a necktie that had all these little pigs on it and with the letters MCP under each pig standing for male chauvinist pig. So these are the not so subtle signals being given of displeasure that I was invading what has historically been a man's profession. So we've had many champions along the way that opened the door for women and I think progress continues to be made in that direction. So women were about 
50% of law school grads in 2017, and there seems to be more and more women uh, being enrolled. And the amount of women at the top ranks of law firms, those who are real equity partners, continues to hover, however, just shy about 20, 25%. And there are also salary disparities that are, you know, equally interesting. So median pay for full-time women lawyers was just about 77% of their male peers. So across all jobs in the field, including the paralegal, judiciary, legal support, and other work, both skilled and unskilled, the women's pay was 51% of men's. And for women of color, the numbers were even you know more disparate. So nearly about 50% of law firm uh, offices nationwide uh, do not have a single woman of color partner within that office. And for myself, when I uh, first went to join the law firm, uh, they paid me $1,000 a month. And uh, I was grateful to have a job. And I didn't you know think that it was anything uh, other than what I should be paid because that's what they offered. And it was not until I went out and opened my own law office that I was able to really see that what I could generate on my own uh, was far greater than what I was being paid. And then could understand that in that sense, uh, it was quite uh, exploitative of my efforts. So the gap between women's academic achievements, they do tend to outperform men, but their subsequent careers do not tend to outperform men. Uh, so, but it's not limited to the law. So in uh, law, uh, medical school, of course, as well, you know, this becoming just about as equal as men in enrollment and women doctors earn about 26% less than men doctors. And uh, for so for doctors and lawyers alike, the pay chasm persists or has probably even widened, even though the education gap has closed. closed. So the academic achievements of men in uh, women in each discipline, which are now undercut by a lack of concomitant earning power, parallel each other in more ways than one. So both medical and law school, while they offer a path to prestigious employment, both law and medicine are very still much male dominated fields and female students of both types of schools have historically gone on to earn and achieve less than their male peers. So I think over time, however, these disparities will become, will become increasingly smaller. Absolutely. I think it is definitely our hope that we can evolve as a society to understand how amazing women are and just not discriminate based on someone's gender, I think. And especially in the 21st century, this should not be the case at all. And I, it's, we really hope that, you know, through, uh, well, learning and through education, we are able to educate ourselves about why it's so important that we just create this uh, equal and equitable world for all. I think one of the interesting things for myself that I have noticed is that while you can be a professional woman and you have the uh, you know code of ethics, you have your civil rights of procedure, you have your criminal codes, you have the rules of court, you have all of these designations that set the ba uh, boundaries and parameters of your performance and your behavior within the context of your professional life. But when it comes to your own personal self, those clear cut boundaries are not codified. They are not set forth in rules of conduct and behavior. And so what becomes very important is for, and I say myself, but basically for everyone, whether you're male or female, and that is to have the development, an inner development of a strong inner system of values and ethical uh, foundations and principles for living 
that become your core values that are very important. And in that sense, it becomes the context of how you should live your life in alignment with your personal commitment to live in accordance with the values and principles and ethics that are important to you so that it becomes the guiding light of how you live your life. And of course, along the way, as we have experiences, they pose challenges to whether or not we can continuously adhere to these values and principles and conduct. And so oftentimes we rationalize not having to um, or trying to rationalize why this particular situation required um, an aberration, a movement away from a certain values and principles. Uh, but usually you cannot avoid your conscience that will tell you instantly whether or not you have crossed the line. But what is interesting to observe is the, um, the mind creating rationalizations, which ultimately speak to the avoidance of total responsibility to hold yourself accountable for how you are conducting your life. Absolutely, that is so true. And I think uh, it would be a much, the world would be a much more amazing and safer place to live in if every single one of us actually uh, adhered to what our conscience uh, kept telling us and uh, kept stayed in line with our values and morals. And it is my hope that especially as young people for us, we can learn from that and learn to stay true to ourselves and not uh, fall to the pressures of what someone else uh, tells us to do. Also, the cultural context in which you grow up is very, very important. So, you know, that has a lot of influence. Absolutely. I completely, completely agree. As you mentioned before, a stable support system is very important in this day and age. So what kind of uh, support systems did you have while going through this journey? Well, primarily, I would say it's very important for young people, uh, you know, in your formative years to have uh, a very uh, important, you know, role models who are, um, you know, very committed to sound values, who live principled lives, who are honorable people and understand the importance of having good values and who can actually teach you how to have sound values. And so like, for example, I'll go back to my mother. I mean, she was definitely a disciplinarian, but she was very strict that you don't lie, that you had to have a certain work ethic. You had to get up early. You had to make your bed. I mean, she, in her own mind, she had a schedule for each of her girl, you know, children. And at the age of nine, you had to learn how to embroider. At the age of 13, you had to go to sewing school and learn how to draft your own patterns and make your own clothes. And at the age of 15, you had to learn how to drive. And throughout all, your schooling was very important. Your report cards got checked. And you know whether you were doing your homework, et cetera. And she attended all of the parent-teacher association meetings. So having someone like that who would really show you what values are, and it's not just, you know, like for example, in our house, she would not have any mops. We had to get down on our hands and knees and mop the floor. And that was her way of teaching us to have humility, that you have to be, you know, doing the seemingly lowly work because it's honorable. And, you know, so she had very, very different ways of teaching us. And I remember uh, one morning I was in her restaurant having breakfast and uh, the person who picked up the, the garbage uh, walked by and I was eating my breakfast. I really had not paid attention and, you know, who was walking around me. And uh, after he left, uh, she just laid into me that I, uh, 
must be mindful always to greet everyone properly. And, you know, she thought I was ignoring him because of, you know, the kind of job that he had. I just hadn't paid attention. But in those ways, she was very, very strict to teaching me, you know, how to honor uh, each person and we do not, you know, uh, marginalize them because of the work that they have, uh, they do. And all work honestly earned is honorable. So that is something very, you know, important that she taught me. So these influences, and I'm very, very grateful that these two uh, beautiful women in my life and that they were women were such powerful, important role models for me. So I think the woman, the mother, is extremely important in being able to help us develop as human beings and to instill in us these important values because the first guru in life is your mother. She's a true teacher. And so to have been blessed with wonderful mother and a beautiful spiritual mother, I consider myself extremely fortunate. Absolutely. And I think I speak for all of us on uh, from the Green Hope team as well. And I say that, yes, our mothers play such an important role in our lives and as role models to for us uh, to understand that, you know, that is what we want to be when uh, not just when we grow up, but throughout our lives. So thank you so much for sharing that with us, Madam Kitadella. Yes, you know, uh, my mother lived to be 99 years old. And one of her famous saying was, hard work never killed anyone. <laughs> and since she lived to be 99 years old, and throughout her whole life, she was just a nonstop tireless worker. You know, I put a lot of credence in her words. And she, never, she always said, don't feel sorry for yourself. You know, in, in, you know, it's like in this, she had this certain phrase that she used to say in Japanese basically was don't give up, you know, keep going, keep going. <laughs> so it's that kind of not falling into self pity and being able to get up and keep going and having that will and determination. You know, these are very, very important uh, role models to have. And I'm very grateful that uh, she was there to teach me from a very young age. But, you know, I did not, of course, you know, as uh, children growing up in a family owned business, we all had to work very hard in the family business. So I was the youngest of five children. And, uh, you know, my job uh, as a little girl, I, this is still in elementary school, you know, before um, like five years old kindergarten. I mean, I had to start filling up the salt and pepper shakers, the sugar bowls, the toothpicks, you know, all those things, scrub all the scuff marks underneath the counter. And of course, as I got older, had to learn how to chop the vegetables and wash the dishes and do all the kind of prep work that is very labor intensive in the restaurant business. So the only time that she would excuse the children from having to work in the restaurant, especially on weekends, when we wanted to go to the beach and have picnics and go to the movies and have fun, was for school-related activities. So it was not to have fun, go to the beach and all that, but if it was for school, it was all right. So believe me, I signed up for every debate, extemporaneous speaking tournament that I could get my hands on <laughs> so I could be excused from working in a restaurant. And it really wasn't until I, be I became a lawyer that I really became grateful for her strictness, the discipline, the work ethic that she instilled in me because I had a huge reservoir that I could pull from to really have the endurance to do the kind of hectic work that my law career demanded. So all these things are not useless, you know? I mean, do I embroider today? No. Do I sew my own clothes today? No. Do I even, you know, do the shopping and cooking and all that today? 
Uh, no, but all these skills are still there that I can pull up. And I actually am a very good cook, but that's a secret, okay? <laughs> but seriously, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And it's, it's truly inspiring. And I just wanted to say your mom is awesome. Like, seriously, it's so great. And I think that she's such an inspiring person. And, uh, and you are such an inspiring person as well, Madam Peter Dawa. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Today, you are the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Parliament of the World's Religions, and you have accomplished so much from helping build a school to founding the International Academy for Transcultural Cooperation. How does it feel when you look back and reflect on your journey? Well, you know, all journeys are journeys filled with challenges. And it's like you are constantly in a big schoolhouse. Uh, where the learning never stops. So it's not as if, oh, phew, I graduated from college and that's it, I don't have to open the books. In actuality, you're always having to learn and learn the lessons. You're always going to be tested along the way. And to the extent you have done your homework and you have practiced, and you know the the inner discipline the spirit actually the spiritual discipline is what is going to hold you through the many challenges in life and this is where the influence of my spiritual mother was supremely important uh, because she actually reframed the context of the challenge to be able to see the divine hand in all things so the orientation towards the sacred, the sacredness of life, uh, the spiritual gifts of gratitude and appreciation, and to see life in a totally different way. So if we give in to our, you know, our uh, enculturations where, you know, name, fame, money, and all those things are hugely important, the reorientation is to see that you know, wealth is not uh, necessarily what you own in the bank or what you own of things, but true wealth and the richness of life comes in being able to see the abundance of God in the multitude of flowers and the incredible genius of the divine to create all kinds of varieties of flowers and, you know, massive amounts of different species and when you think about the incredible galaxies upon galaxies in in the universe and our Milky Way galaxy is just one of many and it is the abundance of the divine and the genius of the divine even in the creation of the human form is just so utterly mind-blowing that one cannot help but be filled with the immense awe, gratitude, and wonder of the mystery of the divine that can, you know, create such genius for all of us to see in its display. And if you get up every morning and look at the sunrise, you know, it's a beautiful painting every morning with different changing colors. And so we get to see the the divine painting every day on the sky canvas and the same for you know the sunset and i often tell my spiritual community you know if you're feeling really down go outside you know at the night and you know it seems very dark but just look at the sky and the stars you know the moon and there's something it just lifts you out of the you know encapsulation of the small, small me, myself, and I to step into the grandeur of the sky that has no partition and to see the immense, immense, infinite beauty and the magnitude of the vastness. So we are, you know, a, like a little grain of sand in a huge, huge beach that has so many incredible grains of sand that collectively create a painting in and of itself 
of remarkable beauty. So everywhere we turn, it depends on how our perceptual field is seeing things. It can be one of deep gratitude, wonderment, and awe and appreciation for the abundance of life that really is not in a bank account, but is everywhere around us. And my spiritual mother said, the greatest gifts from God are free. The sun, the moon, the air, the oceans. And so when you see life that way, there is never enough time to move with a heart of gratitude and wonderment and awe for how truly blessed we are to live in such abundance. For man cannot generate, you know, through material means, that kind in, of infinitude and multiplicity and genius. So there is definitely a higher power that not only created, made our blood and made the drop of grass, which we cannot replicate, but the sun and the moon and the stars and the genius of keeping everything in orbit. You know, we're not doing that. So this higher power, the divine source, the creator of all there is, and every day developing that inner connection within the sacred chamber of our own hearts to that higher consciousness and infinite power is very important for us to be able to develop and cultivate in the development of ourselves as people. But why? Why would that be important? It is important so that we can ultimately become better human beings. And my spiritual mother said to me, the real purpose in life is God realization and God is love. So if you accept that God is love, then you can really bring the living reality, the actualization of the divine in your daily life, right where you are, which is the holy ground through every loving thought, word and action. And that is the greatness and the grandeur of the divine presence here now in your life. And when you contemplate that you have the opportunity to bring that living presence in every thought, word, and deed that you undertake every day of your life, you can see cumulatively your legacy that you are leaving as you move through the world to yourself become that manifestation of the divine essence of love in all that you do. And since the work that you all are undertaking is so important, if you move from that heart of love and in this very important uh, Sanskrit word called seva, which means selfless service. It is the development of the heart of devotion to the higher power that becomes the expression of love in action that is being shared and given freely and generously as your form of loving service to the divine that you would do the best that you can do under any circumstance and you will do it with love with no expectation of return for your own self-aggrandizement or self-edification, but to share that pure and perfect love, which is the essence of who you are with others in its highest form. And that is the true gift of service that everyone can give here and now. And, you know, people have very big ideas. Oh, they have to go out and save the world in a huge way. But you, my spiritual mother also said, if you cannot do the little things, you can't do the big things. And ultimately what she meant is right here, right now, as you go through your life, you know, how you impress people, whether through a loving word, a loving thought, you know, and saying something kind, 
you never know how you can uplift someone because you may not know all the crosses that they may be bearing in their hearts and how having your presence even for a second in their life can be uplifting and inspiring, moving and touching that they remember all their lives. And you may never know how you may have helped someone, but your essence has been so developed to be able to give that. And that is a true gift of life. And giving is life. And so when you know that you can give life in that way, then your life in and of itself becomes glorious and beautiful. And you yourself become that beacon of hope and inspiration to everyone's life that you touch. And so it is my hope for all of the young people in your audience and our young people here right now as the moderators, that you would live your life like that. And, you know, know that you yourself are that expression of pure and perfect love. So my spiritual mother always asks this question. Can you love the unlovables? It's a very interesting, a very deep and profound question to contemplate. Can you love the unlovables? And it is at once a personal challenge for you to be able to move beyond yourself and any kind of expectations that you will be loved in return, that you can just give that pure unconditional love to whatever your perceptual field may be of an un unlovable person. Is it challenging? It sure is. But that is the ultimate uh, challenge to be able to reach that state where you can truly love the unlovables. But in any event, you know, it, it's so exciting that life's sacred journey will unfold all of these experiences that will come your way. And in the back of it, always remember the essence and the reality of who you are that you yourself are that divine essence that comes from this gift of sacred life. And that divine essence is love. That love is sacred. That love is yours to share every moment that you live with every person in your life and every person that you meet. And can you imagine how beautiful and powerful that is. So I commend all of you with that, knowing that you will be able to live life like that. And so I'm very happy to be in good company, knowing that your high-minded ideals to do good in the world will ultimately come from that foundation of powerful, powerful love. That is the agent of true transformation. So thank you. I commend you all to live life like that. Thank you so much, Ms. Blau. It's like so, so, so amazing. And I really hope that we can live our lives that way. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said about selfless love service. I do think that you know, doing even the smallest thing can make a world of difference to another person's life. And when you think about it, you know, about what you said earlier, if you feel down, just go outside, look up at the stars, look at the sky. And, you know, ultimately, you just think that the best gifts in life are, after all, free. So I truly love what you said about that. That's true. You know, and, you know, what we have already in the abundance of our lives, uh, no amount of money can put a price tag on that. And actually it's priceless. But you can just look at one single flower and you actually can go into the bliss to just contemplate the incredible beauty and complexity in one flower. And when you think how many flowers there are 
you know, it's totally uplifting, the abundance, the beauty that's everywhere if we would open our eyes and see. And there's beauty in all of life forms. So, you know, I remember that one of the most touching moments in my life was when I went to a, a small village in a, a desert, a very um, dry area in South India. And the villagers were extremely poor and water was just the most precious commodity. And I was taken to uh, the home uh, of this lady who was like uh, the leader of the community. It was a very, very humble home. We sat on you know, dirt floors. And without any hesitation, because I was a guest in her home, she brought to me a glass of water, which was like the most precious thing she could offer. And she did it, you know, to uh, share this generosity of spirit that she had. A guest had come into her home. It was such a, for her, you know, an, an honorable thing to do. And I was just so touched to see the dignity, grace, and beauty of that woman. I'll always remember her and the generosity of spirit that she had. It was a glass of water, but it was a most precious thing and she shared it freely. So, you know, in these ways, I think about her often and it's been many, many years. So you see, in that fashion, you never know how whatever kindness and the gifts of generosity of your spirit that you give, that is not monetized in any way, that speaks to this profound dignity and respect that people all around us really uh, give to us so freely. And we really have to have great, great appreciation of uh, this deep gratitude for the many, many beautiful, beautiful people in this world. And there truly are, you know, living angels all around us. And, you know, it's, it's uh, so very profound to be able to contemplate that. And the love is so palpable and unspeakable, you know, and these become the gifts of remembrance in your heart that never go away. And, you know, I, I uh, was humbled in her presence. It was truly, I was in the presence of a giant, you know, so never hesitate to have this generosity of spirit. And the gifts of the generosity of spirit cannot be monetized, cannot be ha have any kind of monetary value because it is the free gift from the divine that is so exquisite and has this beautiful fragrance all its own that is otherworldly because of the love that is imbued in it that transports you into another realm, really the heavenly realms of the gifts of the spirit and the divine. All of us have that capacity and we should try to maximize that capacity. When we look around in the world today, there seems to be many, many challenges. And the challenge is to go deeper beyond the face of the challenge to see the immense beauty that is existing in the hearts of all of those undergoing the challenge and still stepping forward in the affirmation of life. So we're very fortunate. Yes, I would definitely agree. It's the small things in life when people appreciate, I feel like the world would be a much happier place, you know? And uh, as a person in a leadership position, do you feel that people view you differently because you're a woman? Or do you feel that society has evolved to see you as a leader, regardless of your gender? 
Well, I think uh, when you are a leader, you know, a certain title uh, comes with it in many types of, you know, organizations or political structures or whatever, because we do give titles, etc. But true leadership ultimately is without a title. And it is how you lead your own life. Because your own self mastery actually is the most difficult mastery in the world. So, uh, you know, you must be a leader within, of yourself and to lead yourself along the way, every step of the journey. And that means that you have developed the skill sets to be able to have, one, develop those important values, and two, to know what your ethical compass is, and three, to abide by them assiduously, and four, to always lead the way for yourself to ensure that you are in alignment with them. When you have those hallmarks uh, and you step into a title position, uh, will the human challenges be there? Uh, and will you face more challenges, whether it's because of your race or gender? All those things come into play. And uh, will you have to be tested to ensure that you have your own you know, wherewithal to be able to rise uh, above to meet the challenges? Yeah, sure, you, sometimes you have to reach way, 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 way down deep inside of yourself to be able to you know, go the distance and withstand the rigors of what you know, responsible roles bring. But the ultimate responsibility is to yourself. Why? Because nobody lives in your skin but you. And you have to be able to be comfortable in your skin and you have to be able to know that you can sleep at night because your conscience is clear that you have done your best and you have you know, tried your best. And, uh, but always the orientation in your heart is that you, you know, ensure that you do not harm anyone um, you know, and you do your best not to create injury. But along the way, it also depends on what is your duty and responsibility to do. So, you know, I also had a spiritual community that, uh, you know, has so many beautiful, wonderful, loving, generous, kind people. And uh, part of heading the spiritual community is to be able to help the development of the inner self, the inner life. So, uh, you know, that requires some refinements, etc., along the way. And in the execution, can appear to be, you know, very strict. But always in the back of it, there is this profound kindness and love that is there. To want to ever see each person realize the fullness and beauty of their own potential and to be able to, you know, grow into that potential. And that is a very, very deep love to want that for another person that always you will be able to move in the world from your highest self and to be a presence in the world that is coming from that higher self. So, you know, it's very important that we always move in the world from your higher self and to reach that higher self, however, takes a lot of, you know, uh, lessons on the sacred journey of life. Absolutely, I think that's so, so important to remember and especially being true to oneself. I think uh, it's, it's such an important thing for humanity as a whole, just to make our world a better place to live in. Yes, so titles, you know, give a certain designation and how we like to give titles and names and you know identify all of the particularities and what we perceive to be you know indi individual forms and structures but what is truly important is to see perceive beyond the form and structure because everything with form and structure will ultimately go back to dust 
and to really come to the appreciation of what is beyond the name and form and title. And that is the essence of sacred life itself. And that is what endures. And so, you know, as we come to the appreciation of the sacredness of life and really have this deep gratitude, we actually perceive differently. We actually move through life differently. And for all of the seeming unkindness that may exist in the world, you don't lose the heart of love. It's always there. And, you know, you may feel like it gets beaten up pretty badly a lot of times, but you don't give up. You persist because you know that the underlying unseen reality is the sacred, divine essence of pure and perfect love. So our journey is to realize that and to tap into that and to bring it into our lives more and more every day. Absolutely. I do think that certain events through one's life play a significant role in shaping thought processes. So do you have a particular experience that changed your perspective of the world or influenced you drastically? Oh, yes. Uh, but, you know, it would, it would take us into the mystical realm. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, uh, it may, um, it's a very, uh, it was a life transforming experience. Let me put it this way. Along the way, sometimes in life, you have profound, what I call the grace of God. And when you are touched with that grace, you are transformed. It totally shifts your entire worldview. And that is an experience I actually had when I was in the uh, sixth grade. And it was in elementary school. And, you know, up until that point in time, I was um, very, very shy. No one would believe that today. What? You shy? When? <laughs> but actually, as a very a shy and introverted person. And, uh, you know, I liked uh, routines that I was very, you know, comfortable with. I didn't like to break routines. And one day, the teacher announced, well, class, Next week, we're going to see your new school. You're going to intermediate school and be very different from elementary school. You're not gonna have one teacher all day. You're gonna have a different teacher for each different subject. And you're also gonna have a whole bunch of new students coming in from diff different elementary schools. And so we're going to visit your intermediate school next week. I hit the panic button. Oh my gosh, I have, you know, go to a new school. I have different teachers for every subject. I, it was really a quite uh, traumatizing to hear that. But I knew that I you know, was living a very anxiety-ridden life in my introversion. So during recess, I was standing outside and I asked myself this question. Are you going to be like this for the rest of your life? And when I asked that question, suddenly in a microsecond, I shot out of my body and went through this rapid fire in milliseconds transformation that cannot be explained. And I came back into my body. And I came back a totally different person. My entire perceptual field of the world had changed from one of introversion to extroversion from one of fear to one of being filled with wonderment and not being able to wait to experience the bounty and the beauty of life. That was such a remarkable change that I could not believe that other people had not witnessed what happened to me. And of course, no one did. It was an, entirely, um, ex an entire experience just for me. And um, But that completely transform my life. When you receive that kind of powerful grace, you never go back to being the same. Absolutely. So that's a remarkable shift. Yeah, absolutely. That is so, so amazing. And just wow. And you know, Madam Kiraga, we've learned so much from 
you today. And I am sure that we are going to keep these lessons with us for our lifetimes. And you know, the, the last thing I just wanted to ask you is, what would your message be to everyone, but especially to girls who dare to dream? Well, you know, the message that I would give to everyone is this, that life is really sacred and it is a sacred journey. And you ultimately have to know where you want to go and what your true purpose in life is. And all of life's experiences will either help or hinder you from attaining that goal. And therefore the choices that you make daily have cumulative effect on your being able to achieve your goal. So my spiritual mother said, our true purpose in life, again, I repeat, is what? God realization. So the question becomes, how does one accomplish that goal? And like I shared earlier, she said that God is love. So if you accept that, then know that your presence every day that you live, whether it comes through a warm smile, a gentle touch, a kind word, comprises that singular drop of water on a stone every single day that will eventually carve that stone. So our life becomes a statement of the cumulative practice that we undertake daily to share love and ultimately to be that expression of love itself. Is it difficult? Yes. And my spiritual mother, you know, like I said, I repeat that profound question, can you love the unlovables? And so this is the highest sharing of yourself with others. And that is to be present every day in, with unconditional love in all of the myriad of little ways every day that you live because cumulatively it ultimately becomes the legacy and statement of your life. So every day, you be that single drop of water that has meaning and purpose that ultimately can not only carve the stone, but collectively together, we can move mountains. Absolutely. And it is uh, my deepest hope that we at Green Hope are able to embody that. Thank you so much, Madam Kiradalo, for sharing your inspirational journey with us. And Success is never accidental. It requires courage, hard work, passion, strength, and self-belief, all of which you exemplify. And I am sure that this is going to motivate every single person who tuned in today. We cannot change the past, but the present and the future are for us to change. And stories such as yours are literally going to be the light to uh, light the way forward. So thank you once again, please stay safe. And to everyone else, we look forward to seeing you at our next episode of Women Impacting the World. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And God bless you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Like I say in Hawaii, aloha. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.